You're listening to Big Table, a podcast about books and conversation presented by Hat and Beard Press, Dub Lab, and Gold Diggers in Los Angeles. I'm your host, JC Gable. For each episode, we speak to one author about a singular book in a long form interview. Each interview is then followed by a brief reading, sometimes from the same book being discussed, sometimes by a like minded title and a different author. But every episode does retain a loose theme throughout and is inspired by the work of radio host and oral historian Studs Turkle. Thanks for listening. I first became aware of Norman Oler's work after reading in one or two sittings his epic history of druggies in the Third Reich, entitled Blitzed. His most recent book, The Bohemians, also published by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, was born from some of the research he was doing in Blitzed. It is a page-turning thriller I couldn't put down, and is essential reading for anyone interested in World War II history, and specifically subterfuge. Oler has written an incredible true story of two idealistic young lovers who led Germany's largest anti-Nazi resistance group right in the darkening heart of Berlin. Haro Schultz Boysen had already shed blood in the fight against Nazism by the time he and Libertas Haas Haye began their whirlwind romance. Drawing on unpublished diaries, letters, and Gestapo files, Oler spins an unforgettable tale of love, heroism, and sacrifice in the Bohemians. Here's my conversation with journalist, novelist, screenwriter, and author, Norman Oler. I uh, first became aware of your work because of your last book about the Nazis, Blitzed. And I'm curious, was it part of your research for the last book that led you down the path to the Bohemians? Um, Well, while I was researching for Blitzed, in Munich looking at files from the Air Force Ministry, um, the infamous ministry headed by uh, Göring uh, of the Luftwaffe, Um, I read a letter by Haro Schulze-Beusen, a name that I had not known before actually, and it was the last letter he wrote, the letter to his father from prison, and I thought it was a very interesting letter. Um, but Haro, as I then researched, never had any uh, connections to drugs. But still, this, he was he, he seemed interesting, but I couldn't you know, put him into the Blitz book because he didn't take drugs. <laughs> so uh, I, 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 I thought after researching a bit more about him and Libertas that uh, maybe this could be uh, a book in its own right, you know. Yeah, it's so fascinating. I have always been fa- fascinated by the sort of underground in World War II in general in every country. But what f- was so striking about this was that they were in Berlin, sort of the heart of the Nazi machine, and um, which obviously just raised the stakes of everything. Uh, but just this cast of characters, there's over 100 people here, this kind of network. Um, and you write in the forward that this is a story of young people who wanted one thing above all all others to live and to love even if their era in which they came of age was uh, steeped in death well that was uh, exactly what interested me to to research people that were young and uh, intelligent and good looking because in Blitz uh, it's a lot about uh, middle aged people who are not intelligent and not good looking actually the, the monsters of the Nazi regime so now I was looking at actually young people who lived during that time who uh, did not want to be part of this madness and uh, who were trying to figure out how can you live in Berlin in 1939 1940 and still keep your senses or keep your consciousness intact and uh, which was quite difficult and and so I, I thought this network that Harrow created among his friends uh, about a hundred hundred fifty people is, is a very interesting case study of how you could actually try to live free in a dictatorship 
as someone who's an underground or un- independent publisher most of my career, I, I think I was drawn to it too, that this, you know, kind of band of resistors were originally gathered behind a publication that kind of morphed into a movement. Is that, is that sort of a, 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 an accurate assessment? I think so. Um, Harrow was the um, publisher of a magazine called Gegner, which means opponent. And the Gegner uh, had basically one uh, one rule, and that was that everyone is allowed to be published. I mean, everyone who's a good writer, I suppose, but uh, the political um, the political points of view were not important. So Harrow actually published a wide uh, variety of voices. This was just before the Nazis took over. Um, so that this was in the Weimar Republic, which was a very open democratic system where uh, a magazine call uh, like Gegner was actually possible. Um, and his idea was that it shouldn't just be um, a magazine on paper. It should be a movement. It should be uh accompanied by Gegner evenings where readers and writers of Ge- of the Gegner meet in Berlin and in other cities in Germany and discuss the topics. Harrow was always trying to form uh, a popular movement. He was always, he was a very political man and he wanted to be active in the development of you know what was going on in Germany. So for him it was to write was to be part of the political discourse, um, and he was quite successful with uh, Gegner. It was was a, a popular, a popular f- a format uh, at the time um, until the Nazis took over, and then of course he ran into problems with the uh, new authorities. What, what's fascinating about your book too is this idea that. Most of the time when you're reading these stories, it's it's emigres who have escaped the Nazis um, and went somewhere else, you know, and had to leave Germany. And, and I, I think, you know, in your narrative, I don't really see any points in their, you know, diaries or, uh, or interactions where they were even thinking of fleeing. It was more about staying there and fighting, which is, you know, very brave of all of these people. Um, you know, and I think just for... People who haven't read the book, I should point out, you know, Harrow works for the Air Ministry, uh, which is part of the Luftwaffe, presumably. And uh, so he has all this um, intrinsic information that would be helpful to the enemy, which, of course, you know, there's this line that they have back channel to the Russians, um, which, uh, you know, makes almost every, all of their activities, not just, um, you know, uh, traitorous by the laws of the time, but also uh, technically uh, espionage as well. Harrow never really considered leaving Germany. I mean, it's a very hard question, I suppose, that people had to answer back then. Should they stay or should they go if they were opposed to the regime? Um, Many people left, especially writers uh, did leave who couldn't publish anymore. And Harrow also couldn't publish anymore. Uh, the Gegner was closed by the Nazis, and um, but Harrow made the decision to stay and to try to change the system from within. Um, we had that we had that same strategy in the late '60s when we had the uh, the student uh, movement in Germany. Uh, they they called it uh, the they called it we are they said we are marching through the institution so we're going into the state and get positions in the state and change the state from within so that was a strategy that Harrow already in, in envisioned um, and he um, became an officer and um, and he used that position to distribute that information um, on the one hand, to all his friends, because he wanted the people in Berlin to see the real picture of uh, Hitler's war plans, uh, for example. And on the other hand, he delivered these uh, this information to Hitler's enemies, which were uh, the Western Allies and the Soviet Union. And for him, I mean, the Soviet Union actually at one point tried to 
hire him as a spy and he said, I'm not going to be a spy. I'm very happy to share information with you because I'm sharing it with everyone who wants to know the true story of how many planes there are and what are the what are what directions the war machine will go next and and stuff like that uh so uh in practice he probably committed or did espionage but uh he was never enlisted by a foreign power so uh this is uh, like a tightrope dance that he was dancing and uh um in the end, the Nazis tried to nail him for giving that information to fo- foreign powers. This band of, of friends and collaborators and, I guess, like-minded individuals um, is, an, is an interesting demographic into itself, too, because it's not necessarily people only aligned with, say, the left. It was academics and some people on the conservative side and some, you know, some of the other formerly formerly viable parties before the Nazi uh, takeover of the government. Um, But you arrived at the title The Bohemians, and I'm curious, is it because a lot of these people were artists and poets and writers um, that that was that was a good phrase really to sort of encapsulate, um, you know, this underground movement that was going on during uh, during the war years in in Germany? Um, Yes, I mean, for Harrow, it was very important to kind of keep that spirit of the Gegner uh, alive that anyone could join uh, be it a a worker or a soldier or a housewife or a teacher or a writer Um, the book is called Bohemians because even if you were just a worker or a student a Harold in a way tried to encourage people to live a bohemian lifestyle. What he understood with that was to live a free lifestyle, to overcome the conventions of society. For him, the Nazi regime was also always a stifling, a morally stifling regime that had, for example, very strict ideas about the role, the gender roles. So the women obviously had to stay at home and would not uh, have great careers in Nazi Germany. Um, And the men were calling the shots. And uh, so Harrow was totally against that. Uh, Libertas is um, the great love of his life and wife, later wife, uh, was always encouraged by Harrow to not uh, stay at home and cook the meals and raise the children, but to go out and be creative and, and have a job. Um, and they were even uh, playing with um, things that, again, the, the, the 60s cu- Cultural Revolution was playing with, uh, how can it work to have more free romantic and even sexual relations? Is it possible that even if you're married, you are allowed to uh, sleep with other people? So these are actually quite, you know, these are thoughts that we we do connect with the 60s, but they already were living those uh, very free ways of, 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 of life in the late 30s. So for Harrow, for example, it was not a big problem when Libertas had a lover and when she actually developed this affair over several months, he, he was fine with it. Because he said, if we really want to attack this patriarchal Nazi regime, we have to live totally different lifestyles and be totally free and let let ourselves be free in our decisions, how to manage our lives. So this actually was quite a radical uh, movement, I think. And I thought it was very interesting to develop such ideas during those dark times. And I think it somehow makes sense to me. So I think that's why the book is called The Bohemians. There's a really funny uh, quote, which I guess is kind of crude, but I, I have to say I laughed out loud when I when I read it, where at one point Stalin is made aware of, of Harrow and, uh, you know, and he, he sends back uh, a note. Let me see if I've got this right. Um, Send your informant from the staff of the German Luftwaffe back to his whore of a mother. 
He scribbles in his notorious green pen in the margins of a top-secret classified report. He's not an informer, but rather a disinformer, J period ST. Well, I mean, Stalin was, did not really understand at all, you know, where was Harold coming from or what was he trying to do? I mean, Stalin was in a different, you know, sphere. So uh, for him, Harold was just this kind of weirdo in Berlin that gives out information, which is nice. But then also he, Stalin knew that Harold was also doing like resistance work within Germany, which is something that the Soviets didn't like at all because they, for them, it was like, why, they, if, if they should give information to us, that's it. And Stalin, and actually, I mean, it's, fun, it's, it's, it's not funny, but it's interesting that Stalin actually trusted Hitler more than an informant like Harold because Stalin actually didn't believe that Hitler would attack the Soviet Union because he had signed a tready with Hitler, the, the, the non the non uh, aggressive the Russian treaty. track exactly yeah so uh, uh, he actually thought that Hitler would um, could be trusted on on his on his signature which was of course uh, totally naive so Stalin made a big mistake here and that mistake was paid with the lives of hundreds of thousands of Russian troops who were killed in the first weeks uh, of the uh, German campaign against the Soviet Union in the summer of 1941. If Stalin would have listened to Harrow because Harrow delivered the exact date of the attack uh, weeks ahead, uh, but Stalin simply didn't believe in it, so he didn't prepare his troops for the actual attack date. If he would have believed uh, Harrow, the the war would have been much more difficult in the East for the Germans than it already developed uh, to be. It's an absolutely fascinating detail in the, you know, in just the general outcome of the war and, and this one character, Harold, that you discovered, and you know, and the, and the what if of what you just said, you know, what if he hadn't been thinking along the lines of the devil I know is better than the devil I don't know, and yes, the thing that uh, I wanted to come back to too is just to give people a little bit of a flavor of the type of subterfuge that Harrow and Libertas and their friends were involved in, which involved, you know, basically old school propaganda, uh, posters and placards, you know, hand-billed type of uh, print material f from that age. And um, obviously in the book, you get into a bunch of different campaigns that they were involved in. Uh, but one that I thought was just absolutely brilliant was this idea of, um, couples kissing in public to distract people so that they mm. could do whatever that they were doing. Um, that's my favorite. Yeah, that's, I mean, I, I think some of the, um, some of the steps in which they had to operate, you know, because of they were in Berlin, yes. they're sort of in the belly of the beast while this is going on. Um, and, and for you, was that the most fun part of the book was sort of looking into what they actually were able to accomplish before they were caught? Um, and, and how they did it. Well, yes, I mean, I had a, a lengthy discussions with my grandfather when I was a teenager, and I always kind of blamed him for not being in the resistance, but for being just a normal collaborator in a way. It wasn't a big deal, but he was still, you know, part of the system because he was just too cowardly, or it was his conviction that it's a good system, I don't know. Uh, but uh, to be actually against it, uh, is is more interesting, and uh, then of course, what do you do against it? What do you, what do you do if you live if you suddenly live in Nazi Germany? Not so easy. Um, so it was interesting for me to to trace how Harrow and Libertas were actually experimenting with different forms of resistance. Um, you mentioned a, a couple of those, and I think they're all difficult and fascinating. Um, so yeah, that's what, that was of course, uh, interesting. And I thought that, that, uh, one night that May, May 17th, 1942, when they, uh, stick these posters all over Berlin saying, uh, posters against the Gestapo and the Nazi war machine, uh, over thousands of these stickers, uh, everywhere in Berlin. I, I thought that was amazing. And I actually had never heard of this before. So discovering all these things that they did uh, was quite thrilling, and I thought it was somehow interesting to to uh, 
make their story come alive again. Because while I was researching their story, I also found one interesting detail that Hitler, once he found out about uh, the network, uh, gave out the order that the memory of this network and the memory about these people shall be destroyed forever so no one would ever learn their story. So now we do have their story and I, that was probably the greatest pleasure for me to write uh, The Bohemians. You know, the whole time I'm reading The Bohemians, I keep thinking to myself, God, the Nazis were so meticulous and so ruthless that they're going to get caught, right? So you're just mm. almost anticipating like, okay, when, what happens? What is the thing that happens that the Gestapo finally catches up with them? Um, mm. And 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 so, you know, did you, when you wrote the book, I mean, you were, you were looking at research materials, presumably. So it sounds like you read the letter first from jail. So you kind of knew the outcome of the book before you started to write it. Mm. Um, but mm. was that was that sort of, um, you know, I guess how you told the story really was that once these illegal activities began and once the war began, you know, the risk was just really, really mm. great that they would be mm. caught. Um, and are you surprised how long they did were able to, you know, to, to sort of to, to, to do this stuff for a couple of years, basically, before, uh, you know, someone sold them out or, you know, they were caught? Well, I mean, they were by far the longest operating resistance network in Nazi Germany. They, because Harrow already started in 34 and he kept going um, for eight years. That's a very long time in a very tight uh, dictatorship, totalitarian dictatorship, where everything is, uh, where there's surveillance everywhere, and uh, people, you know, rat on you all the time. So it's really difficult. And and, and there were there were over a hundred people. So it's interesting to see that, that none of these over one hundred people ever said something to the Gestapo or sold them uh, uh, gave them up uh, this was uh, they they were found out because actually the soviets uh, did a big mistake by sending a radio uh, a message from moscow to brussels to one of the agents in brussels saying to uh, this guy go to berlin and meet haro and libertas maybe they can give you information and so, and and this was this message was coded, but still the Nazis, the Gestapo was able to, uh, to um, uh, decipher it, um, and that's how they got caught. So um, they never made a mistake themselves. Um, I think that shows uh, the discipline, the intelligence, uh, the wit, especially of of Harrow. I mean, he was really a charismatic resistance leader um to me one of the great heroes of that time and i think it's really just a remarkable character i often wished while i was writing the book that he would just step into my writing room and and, and, and sit down and have a chat with me it would, would have been extremely interesting to just hear his thoughts on even our present day uh which also sometimes calls us to resist in some kind of form or to, you know, stay, you know, sharp and to really understand what's going on in the world. Um, so yeah, I think resistance is, is a very interesting topic and um, what they did and how long they did it uh, during the, the right wing dictatorship is just remarkable. The Bohemians, The Lovers Who Led Germany's Resistance Against the Nazis, by Norman Oler, published by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, is out now in hardcover. For the reading this episode, Author Jeffrey Jackson will read from his World War II subterfuge history, Paper Bullets, Two Artists Who Risked Their Lives to Defy the Nazis, published by the Algonquin Press. Suzanne had an idea. 
In secret, at La Roquez, she and Lucy took a large panel of white fabric and stretched it out. They had somehow gotten hold of paint, black, red, and gold, and started drawing enormous letters on the sheet. They wanted to make sure the slogan could be read at a distance. After the paint dried, they rolled up the banner and hid it. Later, carrying the heavy cloth between them, they shuffled just a few yards down the road, then turned into the driveway of the St. Berlad's Church, the oldest Christian site on the island. The modest-sized sanctuary was made of the same brown granite that was used to build La Roquez. A cement of crushed limpet shells taken from the ocean and dissolved in boiling seawater held its walls together. Next to the main church was the small fisherman's chapel that looked out over the bay, a testament to the importance of seeking God's blessing for those who sustained the island's life with the fruits of the ocean. The women peeked into the darkened church. When they saw no one inside, they carried their canvas down the center aisle. Approaching the altar, they steadied it so they could lift it up high. Somehow, perhaps using a ladder or a piece of furniture, they climbed carefully up to the Gothic arch overhead. They hoisted the banner and secured it to the walls. When they unfurled the painted cloth, the German national colors of black, red, and gold letters proclaimed, Jesus is great, but Hitler is greater. Because Jesus died for people, but people die for Hitler. When daylight came, the church's stained glass windows cast colorful light across their words. The text of Proverbs 25.11 carved into the pulpit in French seemed to offer comment. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. They aimed this larger-than-life message squarely at the sense of morality and decency of German troops, but its dark, ironic humor ultimately pointed to the basic truth they repeated in many of their notes. Hitler had become greater, supposedly more powerful, because a new God had convinced men to die for him rather than sacrificing himself on their behalf. Hitler is duping you, Lucy and Suzanne were shouting to the troops in huge letters, because you will pay the price with your life while he continues to live. This was their riskiest move to date, a recklessly dramatic act that spoke to their growing boldness as the occupation dragged on. They needed to turn up the heat. To support Big Table, go to bigtablepodcast.org slash bookshop. You can help us and independent bookstore culture at the same time. Big Table is produced and presented by Hat and Beard Press, Dub Lab, and Gold Diggers in Los Angeles, and is supported by Invisible Republic, a nonprofit arts organization based in Chicago, New York, and Los Angeles. You can learn more about their community based programs and publications at invisiblerepublic.org. Big Table would not exist in the audio world without the expert skill sets, friendship, and dedication of sound designer and editor Matea Bain and audio engineer Jacob Ross. Special thanks to Eric Gorman at Gold Diggers and Alejandro Ali Cohen at Dub Lab for early encouragement and engineering prowess. Thanks again for listening. <laughs>